There are many versions of citizen science, and this will be about our version, I guess. So, a case study. And the Swedish Bird Survey, that's obviously now then a project run at the Univ Lund University. But it's actually financed by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. And we also collaborate and get additional support with all the 21 uh, county administrative boards in Sweden. And our mission is quite simple monitor the population changes among Swedish birds. So very well defined for us. Okay, so the main job is to uh, produce population trends, in this case for the wren, Jarlsmyg. These are 39 years of data, and as you can see it's been increasing in numbers. And of course a part of the mission is try to explain these trends, which is normally very difficult. In this case it's rather easy though, because wrens are very sensitive to cold winters, and with all the warm winters we've, ha we've had the last decades, they've been increasing in numbers. But then you have some real dips, like here, they are all due to very cold winters and then they, the population will go down again. At the same time, we also get data on bird distribution. Here we have the chiff chaff. And what you can see here are basically the two subspecies we have now in Sweden. One is the southern subspecies now coming in from the, from the continent. And of course, we also try to explain these distributions and the changes in distribution. So what about citizens and what about science? Well, here's one of the citizens. We have about 500 persons that count about 1,000 routes per year in different, different schemes, and this has been going on since 1969 when Søren Svensson, who is here in the front row, started this whole thing. And the science, well, I guess that's what Martin and I do when we uh, calculate these trends. But of course the data are also used by us and other scientists for many other uh, uh, research questions. So we spend a lot of time on the analysis and the interpretation, but science is, is not only analysis, it's also an important part of it could be the sampling design and the data collection, and that's what I will focus most on in this talk. So what's our sampling design? Well, in short, the idea is to do repeated, systematic and standardized counts year after year after year after year. Put in other words, try to start with a good sampling design and then change as little as possible. And uh, this means that in the 45 years of this project, very little happened. These are the four important years Søren started with a territory mapping scheme in 1969, which is now closed because it was asked, we had to ask too much from the uh, surveyors to do this. 
Then in 1975, Søren started the three point counts, summer and winter counts. I will refer to this as the old scheme. And then in 1996, he got his, at least scientifically, I think, most brilliant idea ever. He started the fixed routes, which uh, we call the new scheme. And then in, in 2010, Martin and I, uh, together with uh, Uppsala, uh, Uppland, uh, started night routes to imp improve the, the, to get more species into the system. Um, so what about sampling design and data collection then within the Swedish bird survey? Well, the key thing are strict protocols. We really tell the surveyors exactly what, what to do. And this is of course quite obvious. The reason is we want to have a high quality of the data coming in. Because we think if we really start from, this, from the beginning with getting gold in, we hopefully can get some gold out of this. All people are not impressed by this, and uh, some are also put off by this, because, we're, because we do really ask quite a lot from our surveyors. And this is why we also have to spend a lot of time on, on this, making the surveyors aware of the need, the strength, and the beauty of a good scientific sampling design. So that's something we try to do more and more. Uh, why do we do this? Well, we think if the, if the surveyors are aware of why they do things, they will also do them better. So it will add another level of scientific quality. I think it's very important in these days uh, that we also raise the awareness of the scientific method among the citizens. And then, actually, we, we just find a pleasure of, of uh, we are so much fond of this, the scientific method, that we really like to share that uh, with the citizens. And we think that many of them really, really appreciate this too, to, to feel that they are a part of something more specific and uh, more directed. And of course, uh, uh, we want to attract more people in this way. Um, and of course, even more, we want to keep those who are in. Because actually, the trick is to get them in not to get them to stay, because most when they get a bit addicted when they start doing this. So this is what we hope the surveyors will have in mind when they are out there counting the birds, walking along the lines that we provide them with, counting exactly five minutes and, and so on. <clears throat> and how do we do this then? How do we try to convey this uh, mes message? Well, we do it in various ways. As often as we can, we do popular science writing, explaining the importance of the scientific method. We give popular, popular science lectures. We teach this at university courses. <coughs> we have our year reports that we send to all the surveyors. We organize workshops for the surveyors. We've done that for a few years now. Uh, this year we will be in Umeå and in Östersund, where we invite the surveyors and we tell them about the results and they, so they should feel that they are within this uh, community. Uh, and of course we have a project homepage which is now going to be renewed. Um, all of this I'm sure we could do much better. And I now know what the trick is, as Shell told us, you just marry a community. A, com a, communi com <laughs> a communication expert, and so I'm a bit, uh, bit jealous there. So what are the uh, messages that are conveyed then? Well, two examples here, why we needed a new scheme and then the remarkable strength of even a small sample. There has been a lot of focus so far on the advantage of huge samples. We shouldn't forget that there could be quite a good strength in even a small sample. This is the old scheme. So it was a free, it is a free choice scheme, it's still running. Go out into breeding season, which means end of May, early June. Pick out 20 independent points along a path or a road or whatever you want. Count for five minutes, exactly five minutes at each point, everything you hear and everything you see, and then do this next year, the same date, the same time of the day, and so on. So that's, that was the old scheme. <clears throat> there are some potential drawbacks. This was the type of scheme that was started all over Europe. And after a while, scientists started to realize, hmm, there are some potential drawbacks here. One is that... Uh, not all of Sweden, in this case, looks as beautiful as this, but people tend to go to nice places and count the birds. 
This is in a nature reserve, and we know that nature reserves are overrepresented in the, whether these point counts are carried out. Uh, so we may, have, we may not have a habitat representative sample. Another potential drawback is that we have an uneven geographic distribution. This is where the old scheme routes were surveyed in uh, 2013. This is basically a map of the population in Sweden, where people live in Sweden, which is to be expected. And as you can see with the old scheme, we mainly cover the southern half of, of Sweden. And another problem is that uh, if there are, is, are new villas bought, uh, built or a factory built on some of these points, the surveyor may stop and start a new route somewhere else. And that's not good because we want to have the effect of these habitat changes. That's the effect we want to... Uh, so we say, please go on, do the same, the same route. So, this is, these are the reasons why Søren started this new scheme, and it's a set of 716 routes that are put out completely systematically over Sweden. There are 25 kilometers in between, north, west, north, south, and west, east. Um, the person is supposed to walk along this red line, start here in the corner in the morning. Uh, if you get too wet over your, on your, over your, uh, your feet, you can move it to here. So you're allowed to deviate 200 meters from this line. Then you walk around, it's like a six hours walk, and you again um, record everything you hear and everything you say. And you can do this because in Sweden we have the old man's right, as we say, where you're actually allowed to walk basically everywhere apart from people's bedrooms. Okay, so this means that we now by putting out a, a, a scheme like this, we now survey Sweden exactly the way it looks, or in a representative way to what it looks like. And those of you now who think that I've picked two beautiful parts of Sweden, I can say we also monitor these places, also in the proportion that we have them in Sweden. And this is uh, last year's survey. Uh, we don't have people and money enough to survey all the 716 routes each year. But the last year we've been around 500, and the last 10 years we've done more than 400. Yeah? How, how do you do with the fields? I mean, you're not allowed to walk in the fields. No, you have to uh, stop, stop counting and then walk around it the best you can. Or ask the farmer in the day before if you but can walk. But you're still counting in, in some way? Or because, yeah. Well, when you are within 200 meters, you count, yes. Otherwise, otherwise you stop. You miss that. Time. Yeah. This is a small problem because the only species there is are skylarks and you would hear them from quite a distance. So, uh, so for example, we have 7% of the total area in Sweden is, is farmland and 7% of the line transects are within farmland. So we have a representative sample here. So we now have a system that's habitat representative. There is an even geographic distribution and uh, hopefully never ended. This, this has one very good uh, uh, aspect in terms of the science, it's very straightforward to do the analysis. You basically don't have to correct for anything. So the trends can be calculated in a very easy way. Uh, I didn't explain to you, but it's Arco's beautiful program TRIM that we use to calculate this trend, which is no miracle uh, cure. It's a, it's a standardized uh, statistical package, but it's made a bit uh, easier for us to use. Okay, everybody's still not happy with this because Ante samples rather small is something we hear quite a lot. And then I would like to make a point out of that uh, that's not necessarily something that is bad. And uh, we'll look at the election polls in Sweden. Now and then uh, these institutes, they go out and ask citizens, which party will you, would you vote for if there was an election today? And never mind all the figures, just look at this. These are the number of interviews carried out, 1,927. So let's say that there are 2,000 people asked, there are 7.1 million voters, which means that they ask every 3,550 voters what they think. And as you know, these figures are something that's really taken seriously, especially when the, when they, when they, uh, Parties go up, of course. When they go down, they don't take it that seriously, but anyway. So, when I saw this the first time, I was really surprised. It's a very small sample, and still it 
when you pick up, when you take a representative sample, you have a very high power in this. So let's now go to the birds. Uh, the capercaillie is one of the species we are studying, and we have been able to calculate a trend since 1998, and they seem to be doing fairly well in Sweden. Uh, some people say that we can't say anything about the development of capercaillie in Sweden because the data, so is, data set is so ridiculously small, we only count on average 159 capercaillies. That's since 1998. Nowadays we have around, if we do 500 routes, we see 200 capercaillies. So I've tried to figure out what's the sort of the comparable sample size to comparable to the election polls. And uh, there are people much brighter than me that say that uh, this is not a very easy question to answer. But I've just tried, just to give some kind of hint of, of the, 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 the sample size we have. So in the new scheme, we can say that we walk out and ask a representative uh, set of areas. How many capercaillies do you hold? How many capercaillies are there here? First, we, what we need to know then is how large is the area that we cover. When you uh, encounter a capercaillie during our um, surveys, you uh, are al no, almost every time scared to death because they flash right in front of you. That's how you see capercaillies on, on our surveys. It could be the males and the females. And uh, there are actually scientific studies showing that uh, when you walk out in the forest, you will only see birds within 60 meters, basically, when you flush them. If they're outside of there, you will never see them because they just crawl out and you won't, you won't see them. So, just as a rough way, we think that when we walk eight kilometers, yeah, and cover 60 meters in both directions, uh, 30 meters in both directions, we cover about half a square kilometer. That's what we can say how many, how many capercaillies there are. We do 500 routes, we cover, we, we cover, we ask 500 half square kilometers, how many capercaillies do you have? Sweden has 900,000 of those half square kilometers. Total area is 450,000 square kilometers. So we ask every 1,800 half square kilometers, how many capercaillies do you have? Put in another way, how many capercaillies do we see? Well, we see now about 200 each year, and our estimate is that there are 600,000 capercaillies in Sweden. This means that we count every 3,000 capercaillies. And then we can uh, compare that to the election polls where they ask every 3,550 voters. I'm sure there are all sorts of things here with power and so on that, 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 that's tricky to deal with, but just as a sort of idea that it's quite a decent sample for many birds, and it's, it's strictly representative where we do the counts, and that gives it a very high power in itself, just from the design. Just a last example, uh, these are the number of hawk owls. Uh, this is the trend for hawk owl in Sweden. You can see here that the number of birds seen on average per year is seven. So the number varies between one and 21. And this is actually a perfect match with, with the also standardized rodent counts that are carried out also uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency. So even with this almost ridiculously small sample, you get a very strong signal. So. Our view of citizen science, or do, do, if you start something new, if you can, invest in the sampling design and the way data is collected, because it will give you a, a head start in, in, in doing good science, making all the analysis much easier. And at the same time, you can actually also do what uh, was called the Tredjöpgiften at the university, our third mission, uh, and that's to, to, to spread the knowledge and about the scientific method in, in, uh, in the society. Yeah, that's what I plan to say. Thank you. So, so you really picked the species to... to uh, no, they are all as nice. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I mean, take the Capicale, for example, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, because Capicale is a forest species. Forest is the most common habitat in Sweden. It's a species that is pretty common. So, of course, it works pretty well to use Capicale as an example because the Swedish bird counts are good at picking up uh, the dynamics of pretty common species, especially species also occurring in the most common habitat. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what about species that uh, occur in uh, really rare habitats, but are still pretty common, like uh, wetland birds and so on? Can you really say anything about those? Because you're mainly missing those in these standardized groups. Yeah, I know you're saying that, and uh, you, can, you can look at the, the trends themselves, and you, where you can see the, the confidence intervals around the trends and so on. So it's, it's, you can decide yourself whether I would like to believe in this, and if, if you say that, yeah, I would, I would expect to be a good scheme. We should be able to uh, as to, f to detect a 10% change in 10 years. Yes, that's only f for some of the species. But if you're satisfied with having a very good sampling design and knowing that there are very few problems with that, and then you can say, okay, but if we can detect 30% change in 10 years or 50% change in 10 years. That's good enough, probably, for, for what these data are used for. Because as, as, as we know quite for sure that even if you could detect a 5% decline in 10 years, nobody cares. You really have to. And when you, when you have these very... First, when you have really, really strong changes, as strong, then, then, then you, that some action is taken. So what you suggest is that this bird count service mainly for studying population changes say 10 years. Uh, well, it depends on the species. And we can't use it for very much else. Because you were hinting about habitats and stuff in the beginning. If we change habitats, we could perhaps see if, if the bird species are also changing in, in, in population numbers. Didn't you? Is, will that be, be still possible with this kind of data? Sure. But of course, it varies from the most common to the so de depending on which question you ask and with what accuracy you want to detect it, it will vary between, between the species. Now, I think the, the ex example with the KPK was mainly to say that, yes, even with a rather small sample that may not look too impressive, if you have done a careful design, you will come quite close to, you can trust the data. Thank you very much. So we have to move on to the next, the real large patches on this time. And nobody will be surprised to hear that he's going to talk about butterflies. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we'll be online with this as well so people can watch. Um, yeah, I coordinate the Swedish Butterfly Monitoring Team since 2010, uh, but since Åke has a much longer data series and about uh, three times as many volunteers, so I decide, decided that I wouldn't be talking about that, but rather something else that I'm involved in, namely working with um, some of the rarest species in, in Sweden. And uh, some of the ways that I have been looking into how you can explore where they can be found and uh, ways of detec detecting them and seeing if they are uh, disappeared or if they could be relocated. <coughs> and uh, instead of using uh, today's uh, citizen scientists, I might opt for using the dead ones, uh, but also the live ones. So uh, I will be looking at um, some of the trends uh, and what has happened to, to burnet moths and the butterflies in Sweden and relate that to uh, 
all the data that, that we have available, but that people haven't been using all that much. Um, so quite a few of the species are protected by the European Union Habitats Directive. Um, and we have quite a few species in Sweden. We have about 130 species that have been seen here, if we count both butterflies and moths, or and burn moths. Um, and we're fortunate not enough to have 12 of those protected by the European Union. Uh, but what I will talk about is the way we can use historical data to look at both um, <coughs> finding lost populations and also um, understanding population declines and also potentially uh, relocating or uh, um, finding populations that, that uh, appear to have been lost. Uh, so if we look at Sweden from a biographical point of view, uh, you can see that it's a very long country uh, with influences both from from uh, the Atlantic and from the continent, from the south and from the north. So there's a fair amount of different habitats here, and that is part of the explanation for having that many butterfly species. Um, if we split it into different zones, we have a large part of Sweden uh, being an alpine region. Uh, the biggest part of Sweden is within the boreal zone, and here in the south we have a fair amount of continental zone. And all of those have uh, their typical species. But things haven't been go going all that well. Uh, in a review that we did last year, we went through the, all the extinctions that have happened here in the southern part of Sweden uh, in recent time. And the uh, red areas here are uh, grasslands, and the green is forest. And you can see that depending on what province you are in, uh, the, Figures here, four and four and so forth, are the number of extinct species uh, in recent time. Uh, and the number within parentheses is the total number of species. So you can see that uh, Skane has lost about 10 species, or more exactly, it has lost 10 species. So things haven't been going all that well. Um, fortunately, many of them are protected uh, within the um, Habitats Directive, which is a legislation that Sweden signed up for in uh, 1992, uh, but never really influenced in any way. Uh, we could decide that we wouldn't uh, want to have certain species in it, uh, such as Åkergroda, uh, <coughs> more frog, I think, uh, which is extremely common, and I would say that the population is some millions here, which we have to monitor, uh, but there are several species that we uh, could have added, but we, uh, which we didn't. But these are four of the 12 butterflies that, that we have to monitor. And as you can see, we have a fair amount of populations here in, in Sweden. Uh, so there's this particularly interesting one, uh, the Scars uh, Heath, which I will come back to. Uh, but also mountain species like this uh, dusky winged fritillary, the Apollo, and the Scars fritillary. Uh, but the question is, why did they end up uh, uh, What caused this? Uh, it wasn't this girl, but it was something happening some, some time ago. Uh, and if we travel back in time, there is a fair amount of good information available. Uh, this is a short paper by Friedrich Nordström, uh, where he compiled all the available evidence for, for good uh, butterfly data in 1952. So if you look here, you can find that... Uh, some areas are considered to be quite well covered, whereas others are more or less uh, no knowledge at all. If we look at the data from today, uh, this is a compilation of all unique sites from Artportalen, all the unique sites from the Swedish Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, uh, also all confidential sites, uh, and also a fair number of uh, private uh, moth trapping sites. So all these are sites where people are reported uh, uh, lepidopterans from, both moths and, and butterflies. Uh, and it ends up to be being in total some 59,000 sites, and of those uh, we have 39,000 unique sites. And it looks pretty neat. Uh, it looks like uh, Stockholm is extremely well covered, and uh, there's a little spot uh, out of Anderslöv where we don't know something. Uh, but apart from that, it is quite nice. But then this is something that you can look, look closer at. So if we do that with Scania, and we zoom out a little bit, you suddenly find that uh, 
fair amount of area here isn't covered at all. Uh, if you um, go even further, you can see that there are some scattered reports here, but most of the area haven't ever had a single butterfly re reported. Or uh, it's not even butterflies, it's all Lepidopterans. So there's loads of uh, areas here where no one has ever reported anything. Uh, if we go further north uh, to Värmland, where it still looks like it's quite well covered, uh, you find that uh, it's still extremely sparse and uh, uh, sites are... Um, if we move on, you can see that s uh, sites with reports are situated along roads. So most of the area isn't covered at all. So we have data sets uh, where one uh, looks at it as if it's very well covered. Uh, if we look at, at it in detail, there are still enormous gaps. Uh, but the good thing is that both these data sets are quite similar. Uh, some areas have, have improved the coverage, such, such as Ostiotlan here, for example. But overall, uh, it's quite similar. So we can use it to, to look at why some things go wrong. So this is the scarce heath, which has uh, gone extinct from this Scania site in 1990s. Uh, what was the last site in Scania. Uh, so why did it go extinct then? Um, my idea is that we can use the old distribution maps and pinpoint ways in which uh, they could have influenced why things went wrong. Uh, and also whether the species could still be out there. So if we look at another of Nordstrom's uh, works, uh, we can look at one species here, the scarf heath, uh, which was existing like this in the 1950s. This is from 1954. And the pearly heath, uh, Pergas fjaril, this one is called Brungas fjaril, uh, which is more common. They are very closely related. Uh, and what has happened now um, is that we know quite well where we have uh, Pergias fjaril, pearly heath, uh, but the distribution of the scarce heath has contracted a lot. So why did they do that? Uh, one uh, possibility is that the landscapes have changed. Both these sites are from, from Scania and uh, close to areas where, where um, the scarce heaths have been lost in recent time. So you can see that uh, these maps uh, are from 1910, uh, and these are from 1970s, uh, and these ones are from last year. So you can see that the uh, landscape has <coughs> changed dramatically. Uh, you can see that forest has increased, uh, cropland uh, has uh, decreased in many of these areas, and open ground, in many cases, that's uh, former cropland, uh, which has turned into open ground. Uh, ground. Uh, and we also have a, a changing climate going on, um, which can affect these species differently. So these are from the Climatic Risk Atlas, uh, uh, which was made a couple of years ago. Uh, this is for, for the scarce heath, and this is for the pearly heath. And you can see that the pearly heath is predicted to increase quite a lot in Sweden. And uh, in fact, the scarce heath could do that under a changing climate as well. Uh, and then you might wonder if this is true, uh, things that could happen. Um, we'll soon come back to, to the sort of evidence that these models can be quite good. Uh, but first, uh, you can have a look at um, the way people normally work with um, predictions is that you look at where you ha have the species today and where they will end up. We can also uh, go back in time and look at what the distributions looked like in the 1950s and what has happened with the climate since the 19, uh, 1950s and see if that can is explain what has happened to uh, species that become rare. And just to convince you that some of these models can be quite good, uh, this is for yellow leg tortoise shell, V. de Fuchs, which uh, the climate change models predict will colonize uh, eastern Sweden. Uh, this is the data for uh, V. de Fuchs from 1900 to 2011. 
and uh, this is what has happened during the last two years. So, um, quite nice, uh, although they could be lost in a couple of years again, but uh, you can see that uh, the predictive models can have some power. And what we happen to, uh, uh, what we hope to be able to do is to use a number of species pairs that are fairly similar and see why one of them, uh, like the pearly heath, has kept being quite common and uh, been sustained in Sweden, whereas the other, uh, like the scarce heath, has uh, gone down in population. And uh, here we have uh, other species pairs where we also have one threatened species and one which is fairly common. Um, what we also have been doing is to to uh, try to find rare species. Uh, that's uh, not always all that easy because uh, looking for a species that is allegedly somewhere uh, is quite expensive and most of the time um, you're out in the rainy northern Sweden, Swedish weather and see nothing. So that hasn't been very success successful. But what we hope to be doing is to use the sort of distribution records that we have, knowledge of the gaps in the data set that we have, uh, use predicted distributions and the device sampling schemes that are both spatially uh, well covered and also temporally well covered to, to uh, detect rare species and integrate this in, into mobile applications um, where we could have apps uh, that could be a counterpart of geocaching where people could go looking for missing populations instead of missing uh, uh, geocaches somewhere in, in the forest. Uh, and this also opens up the possibility for, for citizen scientists to find sites and, and uh, try to improve them uh, in various ways. So historical data can guide us where we should look and um, volunteer monitoring can find things uh, but the bottom line is that we have vast areas in Sweden that are completely uncharted and no one really knows what is out there. So there are quite exciting possibilities for, for citizen scientists to go out there and actually find things that uh, no one really knew who was around. Uh, and to finish off, I'd like to thank um, both the volunteers of the Swedish Butterfly Monitoring Scheme and also the different organizations that fund us and uh, that we collaborate with. Thank you very much. I wonder when it comes to the, the, the historical data collection, uh, do you think it would be possible to, to recruit uh, citizen scientists or say, or ordinary people to, to, to collect that type of data? I mean, we have thousands of articles uh, or collections in, a, in a museums and, and uh, all sorts of data that could be potentially used if you want to, the historical data set. Uh, in your case, you, you compared with particular food studies. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's a compilation of lot, uh, lots of studies. It's a um, distribution map that Nordstrom compiled in 1954. Uh, and the, the background material for that one is a huge pile of papers that resides on the shelf uh, in uh, Nils Rydholm's apartment in Uppsala. Uh, and we hope to be able to, to digitize that and make use of it. But there is also several initiatives, like, like you suggest, uh, uh, that, that digitize uh, collections and use those records for, for building the, the sort of distribution maps that we are <coughs> after. Yeah. So, so these kind of climate envelope models uh, that you showed us for the folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, it was really beautiful in that case, uh, and I can understand that butterflies could be a good species if, to actually use these kind of models. But in general, have you done have you done some analysis for more species, and how often is it not uh, predict? 
how often do you, don't you observe that, that kind of predictive pattern? Yeah, I would say that that, uh, that might be a um, very lucky coincidence, uh, the, the case of, of the yellow leg tortoise shell. But, but um, uh, I just want to, to use it to illustrate that you can uh, use that sort of uh, uh, climatic envelope models to predict uh, areas where uh, species would be likely to, to, to be found. Uh, and I'm not sure whether the bio-risk paper models are, are the right ones. Uh, that particular paper has also is a thick uh, volume, but they also have an 83-page uh, PDF with errata. So uh, it, it's a little bit dodgy, that publication. But um, overall, I think uh, you can use that sort of input to, to have a guesstimate of where to, to look for things. Uh, and that is quite valuable. Go out in the field and count butterflies. We, we tend to select uh, nice sites, and uh, that's a problem. I think that it's not representative. Why not uh, walk in the trails of these bird people, mm. these squares? Uh, I had a student who, who did that. Uh, we have a paper uh, about to be published, and she she did that. Uh, she was very keen to do so, and, and uh, um, she managed to walk for. Uh, four of those uh, transects in Skane and four of them in uh, Lapland uh, uh, near Luleå. And it turns out that you can't uh, count a full transect. Uh, it's eight kilometers, and uh, if you start when it's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, you, you will not be able to finish. Uh, having said that, she, she was uh, brave and, and very successful, and she, she did about, on average, 6.7 kilometers a day. So you can do it, but it's a very hard work. But, but people are doing that in the UK in the wider countryside about flying monitoring scheme. So I think it's a good way of, of going uh, uh, ahead. One short question. Um, just going to ask with respect to the geocaching for looking at lost populations, for instance, is there a way, ways in which you can think of how you would motivate the volunteers who are doing that, given that they probably won't find the lost population soon? Yeah, um, it, really, it really depends on, on uh, the way you uh, you build the uh, the software, how you mo motivate them for, for going in certain areas, uh, and if the motivation is uh, is uh, built on on uh, going into well uh, going. Uh, into places where no one has ever been before <coughs> and uh, serving the butterfly fauna there, then I think it could be, it still be uh, interesting to people. If they would find something that is considered to be extinct, that would be an added bonus. But just finding what is out there would be interesting to many people. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the <laughs> And now we need to be back again at 20 past. Thank <laughs> you.